Train by day, Kyle Wigginton podcast by night, all day. Close this, close that. Bone down, mm. fucking step away. <laughs> right. Step away. Gotta let it be what it is now. So yeah, I we I recently bought a um a laptop to edit on, mm-hmm. or not a laptop, but a, a desktop to edit on. My desktop, it's like four grand or something. This stupid amount of money, like more than my fucking car's worth. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I paid a ton of money for this thing, and I was, and it works. It, like my editing program works amazing. Uh, but I was like, you know what? I got this gaming computer now. Might as well give it a rip. Mm-hmm. And uh, started playing. Is this new game called um, Star Citizen? Okay, I think I've seen some like YouTube clips on that because I watch people yeah. game online to kind of pick out what game I want to play. I next. wonder if you see my buddy because like there's actually a guy that I do all of his logos and stuff for. Mm-hmm. I design all of his like logos and everything and his animated stuff. Um, and he's a streamer. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Right oh, you're now. good. Don't worry about it. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a streamer. Um, you might have seen some of his stuff, but he started playing Star Citizen, so he's the one that got me into that. Okay, dude, it is. So, like, I'm a huge fan of No Man's Sky. Okay, I haven't played that one. Okay, I fucking... That's the greatest game ever made. Okay. Shouts out No Man's Sky. All right, fair yeah, enough. fucking I'll love that guy. Try. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm a huge fan of that game. Played it on the Xbox, and then uh, now I got this computer, I started trying to play Star Citizen, which is like a more realistic version of No Man's Sky. Okay. So you basically travel the universe, and you explore planets, and do, mm-hmm. like, missions and shit, and you can do anything. Okay. The universe is completely open. But, dude... I started playing this fucking game and I was like, I can't do this. It's too realistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like when I game, I want to escape reality. Fair enough. So I had that same issue actually with uh, GTA 5 when it first came out. Playing that, I found myself so immersed that when I went out into the real world, it was hard to tell the difference between what I had been playing and what I was actually doing. That's bad news in GTA yeah. 5 oh, fuck too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta watch yourself. But no, I'm the immersion, especially with VR, the way the capabilities are going there. Do you have VR headset? No, but I'm getting ready to get one because yeah, I'll bring you. I'll bring mine up here and show you. Okay, yeah, because I've seen people like I've been watching some online streamers who do it. Like I am Krusty is one of them, and then there's like. Um, there's another guy, Let's Game It Out, that I'll watch. And just the the capabilities that VR is bringing to the table is insane, too. So nuts, dude. So I he convinced me to buy a VR headset as well. Mm-hmm. Bought it. And I was like, I fucking hate VR. Because I don't... I'm, I'm a fan of living in the real world. Yeah, yeah, right. So when it comes to, like, living in the VR headsets and stuff... Because I, I forgot what the show was called, but it was a cartoon that came out a while back. And these guys, they would put these neural headsets on and go into this world... Oh shit! Yeah, and I feel like that's the that's where we're going. Okay. So for me, I like I like living in the real world, but I put this VR headset on, and I was like amazed. Yeah, you're literally immersed in a fucking world mm-hmm. everywhere you look. Mm-hmm. And I the one that I got, it's the uh, the Oculus um, is it Oculus Quest Two. Okay, yeah, which I think is like a better version. Yeah, it's like the newest one out, um, and it's all in the headset. Mm-hmm. So you can put it on, and you if you have an open area in your house, which I do, I have yeah, like yeah. a ten by ten open area in the place mm-hmm. I live. You map out the open area with your joysticks. Yeah, yeah. And then anytime you get close to the boundary, it switches from the game to real life. So you don't fucking jump. Like with the videos where they're jumping off or the grandma's falling over because they have no boundary. And I was like, how are those fucking idiots doing that? (laughs) And it's so easy. Yeah. Once you're actually in it, dude, it's so easy. Well, because I think the brain is, you know, it's getting all these signals to tell you like, okay, you're in this new world now with no like boundaries, Mm -hmm. but you're still living in a physical world that actually supposedly has boundaries. Unless that's a simulation in a simulation, right? Yeah, it could be that. Right. So. Who knows anymore? <laughs> right. So Zach Barnett. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, intro to the camera. Yeah. This is, uh, you don't have to intro, but I mean, like, I yeah, just like yeah. to tell people who you are. Um, he and I met one time at the bar. I was bartending at the time. Yeah. It was and like, you started talking about Vipassana. Yeah. It was probably like two or three years ago. It was I guess a while ago, yeah. if not longer. Um, <clears throat> so talking about meditative uh, practice, I'm Zach. Um, been kind of for the past 16 years or so going down a spiritual journey, you know, it starts with little things that you start questioning about yourself. And, uh, by the time it was said and done, I ended up, um, in a place where I was doing a meditative re- retreat for <clears throat> it's 12 days total, but you spend 10 days of it quiet. Like, it's like a specific place. So you can actually, it was started by a guy named S Goenka over in India. Mm-hmm. And he's basically brought this practice back. It was lost for several thousands of years. And he brought this practice back, which is just, it's a mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, right? And so it's about bringing you, speaking of jumping between reality and <laughs> augmented reality, it's about, 
excuse me, it's about being very present with yourself in the moment. Um, that's the whole goal of it. And so uh, I went to a course here in the States in Kaufman, Texas, but there's multiple centers in the US as well as over in Europe and India. Um, you know, if you look up Vipassana, there's a lot of iterations between Wikipedia and then an actual Vipassana.org that ha- lists testing uh, facilities throughout the world where you can go and, and take this course. Mm-hmm. So. And so you go in, you just don't talk for 10 days. Well, so you go in, there's a little more to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would help a lot of people out. Honestly. Oh, for sure. Right. Yeah. Just sh- shut up and listen to your yeah. own self sometimes. <laughs> um, so what, yeah, basically what it is, is the first day you get there, um, you're getting settled in and the, the you're working off of several precepts, right? The first is that, uh, a little bit of humility and, and being humble. So the course is free. Um, what you do is you show up and you'll get a general instruction for what the course is going to be structured like throughout. And so the first day you're there, you can talk a little bit, but you're mostly listening to instruction on what's going to happen. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll put your things away. You're not allowed any phones, books, notepads, like you're supposed to be devoid of anything that you could create or distract, right? The whole idea is to be mindful of things that are actually occurring, which is why they don't chant mantras there's no like om or anything like that um and so what'll happen is on the second day you'll have your breakfast which we also eat a vegan it's a vegan diet during that time so there's no meat there's no you can eat dairy which is that vegan or vegetarian i guess that's vegan vegetarian i forget yeah you can can eat dairy but you're not eating vegans don't eat anything from animals correct so vegetarian so you're not eating any meats or anything like that so uh the highlight is when you get the uh tofu scrambled eggs because that's the closest (laughs) thing to an egg you get um but the food is is delicious uh you eat you know three times a day um And you're basically cleaning out your body and you're trying to get rid of, um, you know, anything that is causing you to distract yourself from being in the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so then you'll spend the next 10 days uh, meditating. Sometimes you're meditating in the hall. Sometimes you're meditating in your room. um, And over the course of the 10 days when you are actually silent, uh, they play a video with S. Goinka, who is kind of telling you what you're experiencing. And it's amazing how spot on these videos are at the end of the day, like what you're going through mentally, because the first day is pretty easy. By day three, you're kind of like, fuck, what, what, what have I chosen to do to myself? <laughs> you know, like I could really just want to get out of here because you're, you're with your own thoughts this whole time. Um, and that's, I think, a place that a lot of people struggle to be with, which is why we have, you know, coping mechanisms or like we put ourselves in these situations that are questionable for our health or our well-being, you know, or just distract us in general. And we go like, to a bar and get drunk. Exactly. Yeah. Which I've been way too guilty of. <laughs> and we all are. Times, yeah. right? <laughs> That's how we met. Shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it's fun to do too, because like yeah. you can meet interesting people like yourself. Like three years ago, I'd never been like, I'm on a podcast with this dude. That's pretty fucking awesome. You know? <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and feel free to interrupt. Cause I know I kind of just. No, like, go for it. Dude, that's, that's what I'm here for. Um, well, not interrupt, but more like contribute, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the big thing is it's supposed to be a mindful mindfulness meditation. So when you're sitting there and it it gets increasingly difficult, you build on it each day. Like you'll start the first day with a breathing technique. And by the time you're done, you're no longer focusing on the sensations you get from breathing. You're focusing on like these little sensations that are happening in your body and your kind of following where your mind goes and realizing that the main purpose of, of this course is to give you the tools to practice being aware of what your thoughts are, but not letting those thoughts cause you to spiral, right? To not latch on to one particular thought and let that ruin the rest of your day or make the rest of your day better, right? Because like, most of our struggles are caused by a craving or aversion. We want things we don't have that we see other people enjoying, or we don't want things that are causing us misery. Or we have a void that we're trying to fill. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that I, that I'm hearing right now, have you heard of, dop- of a dopamine detox? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is what this kind of sounds like. The fact they're taking all the stimulus out of your life mm-hmm. and they're showing, they're giving you a dopamine detox. And normally that's, in my opinion, that's about a week. of yeah, dopamine yeah. detox. So the fact that you're doing it for 10 days uh, states that those last few days is you just with your body. Mm-hmm. So if you get that dopamine detox over, 
because there's a guy named Rudolf Steiner. Are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner? I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Rudolf Steiner, one of the things he talks about is that um, humans, they have to uh, build the etheric body. Mm-hmm. So you have to imprint onto the etheric body by the, uh, by the um, astral body. Mm-hmm. So you have access to the astral body always. And this is when you when you exit the body when you're sleeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go to sleep, you have access to the astral body, but you can't remember what's going on in the astral body. That's mm-hmm. why dreams are like fading as soon as you wake up. Yeah, yeah. So you have to be able to imprint the astral body onto the etheric body so you can have the memories. Right. So one of the things he talks about is to imprint on the etheric body, you have to uh, develop the the sensory organs in a different way. Mm-hmm. So you have to like, may, you have to, have your body be in a more sensitive state. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think uh, this meditation retreat probably does is it allows you to realize that there's more going on around you than just the stimulus on the outside. Oh, a hundred percent. And I think that also starts with like, I mean, the simplest way I can put it is, you know, for anyone who wants to try it too, if you sit there and close your eyes and make sure there's no no ambient noise around you and just focus on the temperature difference between your breathing in and out of your nose. And you realize there's these minute sensations going on all around you every day, not just from yourself, but from all all these other places. And so bringing that attachment instead of being disassociated with it, like kind of what you're saying too, helps you maintain a center as well as have this understanding, which I really like, um, you know, what you're talking about kind of reminds me of, you know, energy is neither created nor destroyed. That's scientific fact, which means that everything that makes us up has been here for yeah. millennia. And so to have this, you know, astrological, spiritual body that needs to attach to a physical form, like ha- having that connection is a big, uh, it's a big step. Cause like, it's also hard to, I feel like, um, carry that through on your day to day. Yeah. I mean, life is so complicated nowadays and for no reason too. Mm-hmm. it's complicated. Like literally if you go to the DMV and you're waiting eight hours to get a fucking ID, there's mm-hmm. no reason for that. No. So, I mean, yeah, that takes you out of like the ability to become spiritual or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it because you're, you're just doing stupid shit. Right. Well, or you get aggravated and you carry that aggravation through to you and then you run into someone who does something that normally wouldn't bother you, you but now you, on. and you pass it on. Yeah. That's definitely me, dude. Especially when I go to the DMV. <laughs> yeah. I fucking hate everyone. Right. <laughs> it's so bad. Well, and then you get there, you wait four hours, the computers go down and they tell you back to come back again tomorrow. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? Why am I even, <laughs> dude, literally the first time I was in New Orleans, I went to the DMV. I was there for eight hours, mm-hmm. read a book the entire time. Mm-hmm. There were people there that were there all day waiting and they mm-hmm. had to come back the next day because they didn't get the chance. I was the last one they went through. Jesus. So lucky, yes. But eight hours at this fucking place. I feel like wait, doing anything, like going to mm-hmm. the airport, mm-hmm. like all this stuff. It's like why there doesn't have to be this many fucking hoops to jump through for everything. I think that's why you have people who uh, go off grid, right? You know? I think I'm going to, uh, that'll be me one day. Yeah. Yeah. One day I'm just going to end up just disappearing and I'm just going to go off grid and live. That's fair. Where would you ideally go to? I would just go like to Arkansas. Like I know the, I know the, the lay of the land there mm-hmm. or Ecuador. Ecuador. Oh, that's a good one too. Yeah. Ecuador. I feel like there's already places set up down there that I could uh, go chill at. Interesting. Yeah. See, I've had uh, an urge when things were too overwhelming to just move to Juneau, Alaska and not tell anybody I did it. See, that's, that's a dangerous place though, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's extreme for sure, but I, it's like, I don't think anyone would look for me there. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Well, so, one, day, one day, if we ever disappear to Ecuador, we can, we can go yeah, down there together. There you yeah. go. That we'll works. I got friends down there. We'll be okay, good. Okay, cool. And I hablo un poquito espanol, so. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. <laughs> so, um, Vipassana, what does that actually mean? Do you so know the definition of it? I actually don't know. Why well, there's a song by uh, Macklemore called Vipassana. Is there really? There really is a song. And I was like, I've heard this word before. And I was like, where have I heard this word? And it was one of his songs, Vipassana. So that's interesting. I would, uh, I love Macklemore actually enjoy his songs. So I'll have to check that out. You have to rec- like, I'll have to look that up here. Um, we'll listen to it after the pod. Okay. Awesome. Um, one of the key figures, so I was dating this woman, Casey, for a while, who actually, she was the one who introduced me to Vipassana. She had done it a couple times before. And it does seem like every time you do it, it gets tougher because you know how to do it better, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you're cutting, uh, the way Goinka says it is basically you're every time you're doing this practice, you're sharpening your scalpel because you're performing these small little operations on your brain where what the Hindus were calling it, it's a Sankara. So these Sankaras are like little seeds that are planted over time. And when you focus on or the reiterative reiterative like habit pattern of your mind, where you go back to it again and again, it's like you're building this pathway to have this, um, response to events in your life that just keeps 
triggering this small trauma, right? So you're trying to get rid of that. You're, you're trying to remove your reaction to that trauma, which brings balance to the mind, right? So I don't know the definition of Vipassana, but I do know the whole goal of it is to bring that balance to yourself overall, right? To be present. Yeah, to be very yeah. present. Um, and sorry, I think I feel, got, feel like I got a little bit dis- no, off like, topic. No, it makes sense what you're saying, because if you think about... If you think about a traumatic experience, okay, that's uh, that's in the past. That's going to mm-hmm. keep har- harboring in the past. Then if you think about the anxieties that we have on a database, that's in the future, right? Right, right. So if you're living in the future anxieties and the past traumas, then you're definitely not present. Right, for sure. So when you delete both of those, then you come back to the center. Exactly. And you're trying to bring, because things are still going to happen. You can't stop these things from happening, yeah. right? So it's about then how you react to it. Instead of burying that seed and ca- cultivating it into a, a weed that like, you know, fucks up your day every day, you're trying to just go, okay, well, this is how I'm reacting. Why am I reacting this way? And then realizing like, maybe that's not the best. And so you, you remove the attachment to it, right? Cause nothing is permanent. Everything will eventually change or disappear. And so feel the feeling. Exactly. Let it go. Let it go. And it will give you peace. Cause if you crave to have that good feeling again, then you're upset because you don't have it right now. Mm-hmm. Or if you don't want what you are feeling because it's negative, then you're hanging on to that. And that's just distracting you from just being present and being more true for yourself in some ways, right? Yeah, I mean, it's there. there's all kind of shit that happens during the daytime. And you just kind of, kind of roll with the punches. Mm-hmm. Was it Bruce Lee? This is be like water. Right. Like none of this shit makes sense until you actually get it broken down like this. And it all starts making sense. It's like, oh, things are going to happen in my day to day life. Maybe mm-hmm. I should just roll with the punches. Right. I mean, it's going to keep going. Well, and that's actually um, a really good. Um, so and that's probably why I was bringing up Casey, because she was the one who introduced me to Vipassana. She had this story that she was told, which I think is very awareness of enlightenment in any form. Right. Um which I should also mention Vipassana is non-denominational. There's no like spirit. There's no, you can be from any religion. You could be atheist. Doesn't matter. It's more, that. more about a meditative practice for yourself. Right. Yeah. Um, so all types go there. But Casey was telling me about enlightenment and the Buddha. And so what's interesting is this monk and his teacher or this young monk and his teacher were basically walking down the path. And, you know, the the older monk is carrying the satchel and it's pretty heavy. And the young monk goes, Master, I want to ask you, what's it like before enlightenment? And the teacher looks at his pack and it's like it's a heavy pack and he kind of shrugs and just keeps walking. And then the young monk goes, well, what's it like, you know, while you're obtaining enlightenment and the monk goes sets his pack down and is like ah, you know get to relieve relieve that burden and then the young monk goes well what's it like after enlightenment the monk picks his pack back up puts it on and then Keeps continues walking. to walk with a smile because like you still have these burdens yeah they're going to exist non-stop so learning to process life while dealing with those things is what the goal I think of Vipassana is. I love that. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I got goosebumps saying yeah, it. Yeah. It's, it's a great analogy. Yeah, yeah. It's really, that's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it's so true also. So do you think this, this Casey girl is enlightened or would she even say that about herself? Oh, no. I mean, I don't think. I mean, how many times has she done this now? Six. She's done okay. it six. How times. many have you done it? Uh, two times. I'm going to do my third one this year. Nice. So, when is that? Well, uh, they do it in December. At least the center in Kaufman does it in December. I might have to sign okay. up. Okay. I'll send you the link because there okay. is, um, and I'll have to look up on my email. I believe it is Vipassana.org for anybody who does want to like look into it more. Mm-hmm. There's also a great YouTube video called the Dhamma Brothers uh, where they bring Vipassana to a prison. Um, and it's interesting to see it's about an hour long documentary on YouTube and just kind of like people who, for, who kind of want to dip their toes in the water and see what it's about. It's very, well, for anyone who knows me, they know it's going to be tough for me to be quiet for 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's everybody. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll let you know, um, when the next one is, I'll send you, get your email from me at the yeah. end of the podcast. Dude, I freaking, I love meditation. Mm-hmm. Like I do it every single day. I mean, meditating for 10 days would almost be, uh, heaven for me. Yeah. 
Because, I mean, I go out in midday and meditate in the midday sun. Really? I freaking love it, dude. It's like something about the warmth of the sun is like a hug for me while I'm meditating. So, and this actually is where I'm actually not the best about it. How long do you find yourself practicing for every day? Oh, bro. Like, sometimes it's like six hours. No shit. It's stupid, dude. I get lost. That's awesome. Oh, my. It's, it's, I have a playlist that I play. Mm -hmm. And I'll be sitting there meditating. And then I'll, like, come back to myself. And I'll realize that I've been sitting there for, like, three, four hours. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, people are, like, walking around me and shit on the roof. (laughs) (laughs) they're just like like zinned out of my head yeah (laughs) no that's i mean that's awesome if you can do that because i think for me because i run a small contracting company and so i find myself working 12 to 14 hours a day and by the time i'm done i don't want to take even the time for myself which is probably when i need it most yeah you know see lucky for me you know this right here is a pretty cool setup yeah yeah so i mean there are days whenever you know i come in here and work in the morning time and i have the afternoons to go do my my little practices and stuff yeah um but yeah, dude, I, I, I don't know. I freaking love it so much. There's a, uh, and I find that I get great ideas mm-hmm. and uh, I was thinking about this. I, I try to break everything down scientifically. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I was, that I've been thinking about is that once you, um, you're familiar with the Kundalini and stuff, right? I am. Yes. Okay. So once you raise the Kundalini energy up the spine, you create the flower on the head, right? Mm-hmm. So whenever I'm out there meditating and I'm in this Zen state and I'm typically, you know, upright in my little, my position that I have, mm-hmm. The Kundalini energy has risen. The flower is um, out. The photons are hitting my head. Mm-hmm. And photons are just packets of, uh, of information, yeah. packets of energy. So I feel like these photons are hitting the flower, the crown, mm-hmm. and they're actually giving me these ideas. Okay. Like, I don't think the ideas are actually mine because they're fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I can't come up with this shit. Uh-oh, the truth is out there. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's where I get all my ideas. So if you guys go to the sun, ask the sun. Uh huh. No, I like that because I think that is something to be to be said where we're our bodies are constantly interacting with the energy around us right whether it's coming from the sun the plants the environment or other people you know and so i think there's definitely that's an admirable to be able to sit for that long because i think that's my my big struggle especially um during vipassana is later in the course you're going to do an hour sit where you don't move Mm -hmm. at all and it's like it's very difficult. So to spend six hours, dude, I that fucking would, love that's it, dude. impressive. Like it's, it's not even, you're not even there anymore. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Yeah, Once yeah. you get to that level of like, um, mental state, mm-hmm. it's like your body just is there. Have you ever tried doing it without the music? No, I never have. Yeah. Yeah. I usually meditate with the music and it's, it's so weird. And people have, they, if anyone, mom, mom probably watches this. <laughs> um, and she's probably like, this guy's fucking crazy. You're He's right. like my son. <laughs> but no, I tell people all the time that, the, the time when I was like in my, when I was like reaching like peak of how, of where I was, I was able to shut my Bluetooth headphones off just by meditating. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was one of the reasons I started meditating with music in the first place, because I, I realized whenever I hit a certain level of whatever was going on mm-hmm. that I had something to notify me. Mm-hmm. Cause I mean, typically whenever you hit that, like that enlightenment or whatever you want to call it, there's, there's no way to tell. You're right. just like there, you're zinned out. But if you actually have something that shuts off while you're doing it. Mm-hmm. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. See, and that's, um, yeah, I, that's. Well, like yeah. I said, the government's probably going to come and take <laughs> me away after they hear this shit. Say, what is that? Uh, the men who stare at goats. Was well, that you've, the- you've seen the, um, the old Renaissance paintings of the saints. Like there are saints, they have these like halos. These oh yeah, halos. yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I think that's just an electromagnetic field mm-hmm. that they've been able to activate by mm-hmm. raising the kundalini energy up the spine. When it hits the the bulb of the head, it activates this um, this radiance around the head. And I think that was what was happening is when the Bluetooth headphones, because they actually connect through your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whenever I was activating that, it was shutting them off. That is awesome. Yeah, I know, and I that's a level of connectivity. I think that. Um, would be interesting if more people could kind of get into. Cause it's like, I'd know in my own life and there's speaking of photons, there's, um, you, you know, you're aware of the double photon experiment, the double slit experiment. Um, they have a secondary version of it where they actually had people think about which slit they wanted the photon to go to. And under observation, it increased the probability upwards. And I'm completely, probably not going to be hundred percent accurate with the numbers, but it was like, instead of being like a 50, 50, like it could go through either one, it was upwards of like 75. They were able to manipulate it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Which, which just shows that your intention or the energy you're putting out there can actually interact with other energy. Yeah. Well, it's like you were saying, dude, like energy can't be created nor destroyed. Mm-hmm. You are energy. Mm-hmm. 
we just been taught this entire time that like everything around us is, is actually material, but no, this is energy too. Right. Yeah. So whenever you start realizing this, and this is where it comes in the, the Hindu and the, the Hindu practices, like mm-hmm. the science of yoga is they, they start, they tell you, I think it's called, and I would, I'm going to fuck this word up. <laughs> it's called like Samanya. Okay. Samanya. I think it's what it's called. Okay. Samya. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, yeah. Yeah. The Hindus, they, they can explain it to me, uh-huh. but um, <laughs> what they do is they'll, they'll take and they'll, they'll practice this. Uh, it's breaking it down to it's like um, it's root forms, mm-hmm. everything around us. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about like energetic forms. But they said, you can also do it on your senses. Okay. So if you can break your senses down to their root functionality, then you can actually start accessing different senses. Yeah. Which would make a lot of sense, actually. I yeah. like, and I like that because it reminds me. intended. What did you say? Pun intended. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I see what you, there you go. Mm-hmm. I was a little slower member of the class here. Yeah. Um, no, I really, it also really likes, or uh, it makes me really think of the movie, and it's an old one. Um, I think it was What the Bleep Do We Know? Was which that? it was a movie way back in the day when, when quantum physics were kind of like just starting to uh, come out there and about how our interactions with the energy in the world around us are always like influenced either we're influencing it or it's influencing us and having that sense of like what's going on around us and like in a way touch it reaching out and touching that environment around us right yeah so yeah it's a pretty uh I love talking about that type of stuff and thinking about like the possibilities out there. Like if we were to open ourselves up to being a more like free, free mentally and physically in a way, like, which is actually the first time I did Vipassana, you know, one of my, two of my coping mechanisms are booze and cigarettes. Right. Uh And so the first time I did Vipassana, I go in there and you're not, you know, the strongest uh, drug in that in that course is some caffeine in the black tea you might drink in the morning. Right. So I'm not smoking, not drinking during the course. And when I got out that first time, I didn't intend to, but for the next like six, seven months, I didn't drink and I didn't smoke. And it was just like, I was practice. I had practiced to the point where, and I was continuing my practice on a day to day basis, which I think is an important part. You can't just go to this course and be like, Oh, I'm, I'm fixed. It's a day, day to day process. Routine, yeah. Oh yeah. And so during that time, like during that practicing time, it was interesting that those vices just kind of dropped off because I was pr- not hanging on to this anxiety of like, fuck, this is stressing me out, you know? So, and I, I aspire to actually kind of get back there because the past you know, the time I went last, like there was a lot of things that happened in my life right afterwards. I had a business partner of mine who passed on like, um, some other struggles with like running the business, which is a day to day, you know, problem in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. As you know, like (laughs) the setup and the, you never stop your employees get those eight hours and they're out. You're there for 12. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, um, you know, I aspire to get back to that place. And so I think that's the hard part too, is, um, awareness is its own like blessing and a curse, right? Cause when you're not practicing, you know, what could fix your life, mm-hmm. but then you're not doing it anyway. <laughs> so it's like, a, it's a twofold. What's well, easy for us to be lazy. It's easy for, for sure. us to go, Oh, well, you know, I could meditate for an hour or I could just drink these beers. Mm-hmm. And I, that's way more fun to do oh, yeah. than to sit out there and meditate until you hit that level of like bliss of like knowing the, what the bliss is like. Mm-hmm. Then you're like, okay, well, that's way better than this, but it just takes longer to get there. It's not as easy. Well, right. And that's actually, I've he- heard theories about that too, especially like when it comes to psilocybin and, and ayahuasca, where it's like, those are the reason I think people like them so much. And I'm, I'm a proponent for certain things and having proper shaman do them. I think there's a lot of people out there who are taking advantage of that, but do they do that at the retreats? No. Okay. So the retreat is like there's nothing you are completely sober you're cleaning yourself out right Right. but i think some of the psychedelics are are giving us a um basically a window into what the other side looks like right cheat code yeah a cheat code (laughs) briefly right (laughs) and so it's like you're able to glimpse the other side and i think that also like plays a part in what you're talking about you get a brief look into it and then you go, okay, well, do I really want to dedicate myself to kind of like what you're doing, spending the time to get to a place where I'm naturally able to do it because these things exist. Yeah. You know, it's just, can we train ourselves? Are we willing to take the time to do it as opposed to like, like you said, the cheat code, that's a perfect way to put it. Dude, well, so for me, I'm a huge proponent of mushrooms. Oh, for sure. They changed my life. Mm-hmm. Like literally changed my life. Like I was, I was going out and drinking like all the time, mm-hmm. you know, living in New Orleans. Easy yeah. To do. Oh yeah. Just getting trashed, like hung over all the time. Did my first dose of psilocybin and my life just went whoop. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is another one of the things the government's going to come at me for. <laughs> but I mean, no, I, I recommend them to, to anyone. I probably shouldn't recommend anything to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> so no, yeah, do them if you want to, but yeah. don't think they're going to like, uh, cause I know a lot, a lot of my friends, they want to try them, but they're raising kids mm-hmm. and they're afraid that it's going to change their personality. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, then I wouldn't do them until after the kids get out. Mm-hmm. But I think every, every human should, uh, should try them at least once in their life. I would completely agree with that. Yeah. Then they've done studies where low consistent dose of psilocybin are actually medicinally more effective than using like the things we prescribe in large doses. ADHD. Mm-hmm. I microdose every day and, it and I focus. don't take any, any other drugs. Mm-hmm. So like, uh, people tell me to take Adderall. No, no. I microdose every day and that's what I do. Oh yeah. Well, in, Adderall is like legal meth, yeah. you know, mushrooms are born of this earth, you know, especially like when you think about the neural net and this is what really kind of wigs me out about it. And I really enjoy the thunder you heard. Is that what that was? I, I, I was like, was what thunder. the, I was like, is Godzilla coming? What is going on? <laughs> Not Sorry, ominous at all. Off, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Um, <clears throat> You know, are you aware of like the studies they've done in the forest where even non, okay, so even non psychedelic mushrooms create this network throughout the forest floor where they are communicating with each other. So they've, people and scientists have gone out, botanists have gone out and they'll actually probe one section of the forest floor and they will get a synaptic, uh, what I can, you know, basically equate to, and I think most people can understand a synaptic response that is traversing throughout that entire like colony of mushrooms, and then it could be acres wide Yeah, and they're communicating with each other. So how interesting that mushrooms are bringing our neural network into this connectivity with the rest of everything fucking else. No, it's so tight, dude. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I, okay. So two things, one thing is I want, whenever I die, Mm -hmm. I want to have my body sprinkled with psilocybin spores. Okay. And then I want to grow mushrooms off my body because I have this theory. It's a wild theory. So get ready. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Um, I have this theory that since mushrooms are actually closer related to humans, right? To, mm-hmm. an, to animals. Mm-hmm. You know, Cause like the, you have the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and then mushrooms actually stem from the animal kingdom. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I feel like they're the middleman between us communicating with plants. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Okay. So I feel like. I feel like that I can do a knowledge transfer Mm -hmm. by allowing the mushrooms to consume my body and then my friends eat the mushrooms. I feel like my knowledge will transfer into them. That's an interesting concept. It may, might not be that far off from the truth. Cause like the fact that the retention, so you're reminding me of another cool little, um, it was a science study that was done with, uh, butterflies. And so these butterflies start out as caterpillars, right? Mm -hmm. In the in the uh, pupa stage, when they go into the cocoon, they completely liquefy. There's nothing that resembles a caterpillar at all, and nothing that resembles a butterfly at all. And so, what these scientists did is they were subjecting, <laughs> as humanely as possible, right, uh, <laughs> these caterpillars to a pheromone that would indu- that was contingent, kind of like reverse of Pavlov's Pavlov's dog. You know, they would have a negative stimulant applied during a certain aromatic smell. And these caterpillars would then shy away from it, right? So these caterpillars are kept. They go into the pupa st- or the larva state or wow, sorry, the cocoon stage, and they completely liquefy. And then whenever they finish maturing and basically come building themselves into a butterfly and then emerge, they would then subject the butterflies that had been the, from that same group of ca- caterpillars to that same aromatic smell, and they had an adverse reaction. Mm. So they carried their cells. It's their cells remembered what had happened when they were a caterpillar through complete liquefaction and restructuring into a butterfly. So it's like what you're saying. I think knowledge is passed on through energy in some facet. Yeah. So you're, I don't think you're that far off from the truth there or well, possibility. You can eat me if you, if I, <laughs> if I die first, you can try it out. Fair enough. I just let me know where you're uh, covered in psilocybin. Oh, we're just going to, we're just going to fucking throw <laughs> the like? mushrooms on the bar and just like let people come in and grab them. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, isn't that nuts that something can liquefy? Like, mm-hmm. what do you think that process is like for the caterpillar? That, so Maybe that's what the afterlife is for us, right? Like our energy is now out there until it's restructured in a form, in a physical form again of some kind. I've actually thought about that before because you think about your sperm, Mm -hmm. sperm goes into the egg. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
then you think about the human being, mm -hmm. right? So your spinal column and your brain is kind of like the sperm. Yeah, yeah. The egg grew around you as the body. Okay, I like this. Okay. So if you can manipulate the energy and then exit the body, you mm -hmm. essentially take the sperm out of the body again. Mm -hmm. Then you can fly into the core of the planet, which is the new egg. Okay. And then you impregnate the planet and emerges to God. Damn. Okay. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, I like I like the idea. This is some stuff where it's like... Or maybe the sun's the egg. I don't know. It, it could be any. I mean, any bo celestial body, I would think. Yeah. On some level. You got to figure out which one of the planets you want to fuck. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I guess that's why we call it Mother Earth. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Just what do you think is going to pop out of that bitch? No, though? God. Yeah. I have no idea. Especially with the way it's going nowadays. Right. Not what good. The fucking world, dude. Like, I, yeah. So there's a look. New Orleans. If you one of our one of one of the major streets, you know, Norman C. Francis. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, there has been the lights have been out on Norman C. Francis, a major street here in New Orleans. For people who aren't from New Orleans, the <coughs> lights have been at a uh, four way stop for two weeks now, two and a half weeks. See, why? What's the reason? The reason is the city doesn't have enough engineers to fix it. It's a street light. I know, right? <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Uh -huh. uh, it's, I think the fact is they're just taking the money and pocketing the money rather than actually paying to get shit fixed. I mean, if you look at the roads, look, and there's, there's, there's good excuses for the roads. The mm -hmm. fact that this is a sinking city. Right. I understand that one. Um, but if you think about the pumps, when oh, they yeah. talk about hurricane season, there's always one pump that's not working. Well, in on top of that, I've been told, and now I've never fact checked myself, but I've been told multiple times that the and the the people who are maintaining the pumps ask for millions of dollars to fix these pumps that are, were put in so long ago that the technology is antiquated. You have two old dudes who barely like know anything else about the world and they're just living down there and they're the only ones who know how to fix it. It would be cheaper to have replaced the pumps in its entirety with more effective equipment at this point mm -hmm. than to let them maintain them where most of the money is being pocketed because they're not being fixed Yeah. on top of, uh, was it, two or three years ago, maybe it was about four when uptown here on Ferret for people who aren't aware, um, or from here, uptown never floods. We had a hard rainstorm and we actually, at one of my dad's places, we got, um, about two inches of water into the bottom unit, which never happens. Shortly thereafter, they sent someone into, I think it was the Lafitte Greenway pump, um, and they ended up finding and removing 350 tons of Mardi Gras beads what along with fuck? along with four car chassis. What? So who the hell had not been down there long enough to have, this was all over the news. Car chassis? Literal car chassis had been washed away down these drains, and this is what was causing some of the flooding because the pipes weren't clear. Yeah. Yeah. So we're paying astronomical sewage and water boards bills, by the mm -hmm. way, and they're not even going down with a flashlight to go, oh, maybe we should clean that out. Yeah. So that's a problem when you have um, children running the planet. Right. Yeah. And this is I think this is in all like many major cities too. Mm -hmm. like, things could, we have the technology, we have the brains to do things right. Um, but greed is taking over. Right. And what do you think that, why do you think that is because of people aren't meditating and stuff? Cause I mean, that's, I think that's, that took the greed out of my life. Mm -hmm. Like I, I now want to give more than I receive always. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to do with that mindfulness aspect. I would, I would say that would play a big part if people meditated more and focused more on, cause I, I can't, I find it hard to believe that people, especially the super wealthy are any happier than people who are struggling to put food on the table. Oh, they're not. I can, I can tell you this. I know some people that have more money than they know what to do with mm -hmm. and they are, they sit at home and are just miserable. Right. And so I would undoubtedly say if people were to meditate, you could still be, you know, any religion you want, just take five to 10 minutes a day, study your meditate for yourself. And I think you'll find that you're a happier person, which means you treat other people happier. And I think you'd see a spread of, you know, instead of this very uneven distribution of wealth, you'd see people who generally want to do good. You know, I think there's, there's a lot wrong, you know, all over the world and different for different reasons, but it's not unproven that a much more balanced economy and sense of community 
which I think meditation also builds a sense of community, right? Cause you're treating other people fairly. Well, that's actually <clears throat> how this bar has grown too, mm -hmm. because people treat it as their communal space. Mm -hmm. It's not treated as a business or as a bar. It's treated as like my living room. Yeah. 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 So I mean, people come here and they hang out mm -hmm. they talk about like shit, like we're talking about right now. Right. Yeah. So well, this I mean, is how we actually got on this. This is exactly how it is. Yeah, we come. This is what we do on the weekends. We come uh -huh. here and we talk about things like this. So that's one day I was like, "Why don't we just record this?" Right, yeah. which I think is a great idea. So I, here's what I want to do because mm -hmm. we'll wrap this up. But I want to, if I don't make it to the Vipassana with you this mm -hmm. time, I want to have a podcast with you directly after you get back. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I'd I'd be down for that. Okay, because I want to see because we we're seeing him right now. Mm -hmm. I would like to see you directly after the pasta and see like how things are are different. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'd be down to do that. Well, Zach Zach Barnett. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Burnett yeah. or Barnett? Barnett. Barnett. Yeah. Do you, do you have social media or anything you want to? No, uh, not as active as I should be. So. Well, okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and maybe that's something we work on too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'd be down with that, dude. Thank you for coming in today, Likewise. brother. Yes. Always a good time. Love it, dude. Thanks.